You know, it's interesting, just yesterday I came across an article on social media that captures the very essence of what I want to talk to you about today. This article was about a lady that had been to hospital recently in one of our large city hospitals here in Australia. You see, the article actually highlighted that she was frustrated with the hospital's response or lack of response to the situation that had arised. You know, it's not easy being a patient in the healthcare system, there's no doubt about it. It's a complicated system to navigate with hundreds of different specialties, hundreds of different services, and it's hard to know where to go sometimes. But when we finally do get seen by a healthcare professional, then we're confronted with language that's hard to understand and even harder to pronounce. It's pronounced pneumonia ultramicroscopic silicovolcanoconiosis. Okay, you got that? <laughs> Let's have another try at the next word, which is another very difficult medical term to pronounce. The reality is things go wrong in healthcare. You'd be amazed at the statistics around the amount of medical incidents that actually happen in healthcare. But on top of that, like that article that was in the social media, sometimes people, even without a medical incident or an error, people have a traumatic experience. It's a tough time for people in a very vulnerable period of their life. But what I've come to learn is that people want something quite simple when things do go wrong in healthcare. When they've had a traumatic experience, they want to be able to share their story. And they want to be able to tell it to the right people, meaning healthcare professionals. They don't want to go and talk to a complaints department. They want to come and talk to us as health providers and share their story. Not to blame us, not to criticise, but just to say, hey, I had this bad experience and I want you to learn from this. And it's also important for us as healthcare providers to actually acknowledge our part. That's a powerful thing to be able to provide patients in terms of their healing. And we're relevant to actually say this tough word, to actually say, I'm sorry. It doesn't necessarily have to mean that I was at fault, but it's to say, I'm sorry that you had this bad experience. Because there's no doubt about it, healthcare professionals are a committed group of people. They work around the clock and they study for hours on end to provide the best experience they can. But the nature of medicine is things can't always end up well. So it's important to have that conversation. There's a rumour that saying sorry creates a threat of being sued. Maybe that's the case, but there's also a lot of study a lot of research out there to actually support the complete opposite. It actually reduces the likelihood of litigation. The reason people tend to sue is because they can't have their story heard. So they either go to the newspaper or they take it to a courtroom in order to have their story heard. That's what it's all about. So it became this question for me personally, is why, isn't that we're, why are we not listening to our patients' stories? Why are we putting up this wall of defence? And why do we have so much trouble saying this word sorry? As I'm sure you can all appreciate, you've had times in your life where probably a sorry would have been the right thing to say. But we tend not to. We tend to hold back. So this is the question that remained in my head for quite some time. What was actually holding us back from actually having this conversation with our patients? And it actually took me a few years to actually get my head around this. What was it in the culture that was preventing us from having an honest conversation with patients and family, knowing very well that that would actually heal their journey. So it was here, actually, where this journey began for me. I was working in a, one of the largest emergency departments in the world, seeing high volumes of very extreme trauma. And there was one particular day that I remember like it was yesterday. A lady had been brought in by ambulance, placed on the stretcher in the trauma room. And there was me carrying her leg. You see, her leg had actually been torn off after being hit by a train just beneath the hip. So I was walking along the trauma bay with this leg and her shoe was actually still on. It was a blue shoe with laces. And I remember in that moment thinking, wow, this leg's really heavy. But then I went on to realise something. I realised I'd actually lost something. It wasn't my keys, it wasn't my wallet, and it wasn't my iPhone. It was my emotions. 
They were gone. But in this moment, I realised not only had I lost connection with my own emotions, I'd lost the ability to empathise for the patient and the family and for their experience. So I realised in that moment that I was only half providing care. Patients want more than just the technical expertise of healthcare professionals. And that's why often people become frustrated and they often describe it as poor communication. So I actually decided it was time for me to actually take a break from this environment. You see, I was warned several years prior to working in this field that you would become emotionally numb, you would lose compassion. I actually went to the other side of the world and spent two years in the Arctic Circle, up near the North Pole. I never saw Santa Claus. But I spent time in a small remote community of around 500 people on a place called Baffin Island. Here during winter, the average temperature was minus 25. And here I spent two years amongst the Inuit population. Amazing people, very caring, great sense of community. But it was here that I actually started to reclaim a sense of community and a sense of connection with people. You see, in this particular environment, I couldn't hide like I could in a big, busy hospital where we're quite anonymous. We're disconnected from the people out in the community. You see, here, I was not just working as a remote area nurse. I happened to be a paramedic, a doctor, the anaesthetist, the pathologist, the radiologist, the radiographer, the social worker, the psychologist, and sometimes the cleaner. Here, I was part of what I came across as being the ripple effect when somebody has a particular health issue. So when somebody died, whether it be a heart attack or a suicide in this community, or someone was involved in a traumatic experience or a social issue, I was part of every step, every part of this patient's journey, as well as the community and their loved ones. I experienced every part of that step. You see, in the hospital, we tend to be part of just one point in time of a patient's journey. So we're actually not aware of the complete impact that patients experience when they have a challenging time in healthcare. And on one particular day, I actually made a clinical error. It was a young boy that presented with abdominal pain. I sent him on his way, not too concerned, but it turned out he had appendicitis. His appendix burst. He had to be flown out of the community to undergo emergency surgery. And he spent time in the intensive care unit. And what I learned here was the power of making a mistake in a small community because I felt that. When we do make mistakes, and the reality is we do make mistakes in healthcare, I was embarrassed. It wasn't good for my ego. And I actually walked around town feeling very different because I didn't know how the community perceived what I'd done. When I went to the, the uh, shop the very next day, I bought bread off this boy's mother. I couldn't hide. I had nowhere to hide. So when the boy finally returned healthy back into the community, we had a conversation. And he actually apologised to me for all the trouble he'd caused. So there was a moment in my mind where I thought, wow, I think I can get away with this. I can just slide out under the radar. And they had then none the wiser. But it didn't feel right in this community. The truth is, I've seen cases and been involved in cases in healthcare where we have slid it under the radar because the patient's none the wiser. But in this location, it didn't feel right. These are people that welcomed me into their community and trusted me to look after the health and well-being of people in desperate times. So I had to draw from my courage and to actually look at them in the eyes and explain actually the mistake that I'd made, and I said sorry. And you could actually sense it in their smile as to the, the appreciation they had for my honesty. So while still in the Arctic Circle, I actually started working for an air ambulance company. And here we would actually fly around remote communities in this particular region in order to remove patients that were sick or injured that needed to go to a major hospital. On one particular day, we actually flew into a remote community in order to retrieve a man that had been bashed by two men with baseball bats. It was almost like a mafia-style attack. So I came in, and we actually loaded him into the back of the aircraft in order to fly him for two hours to a major city hospital down south. 
And so this was the back of my office, quite a confined space. So we had this patient loaded onto a stretcher into the back of the aircraft where he had a hard collar in place, IV fluids, and he was strapped down onto the stretcher with seat belts across his chest and his legs. The aircraft was taxiing, positioning, ready for takeoff on a day that was around minus 25 degrees Celsius, with the runway, a dirt runway, completely covered in ice and snow. So we were just about ready for takeoff, and the patient actually became agitated. So he actually started unbuckling himself and to start to get up. So I gently placed my hand on his shoulder, pushed him down, and said, You just need to keep still, we're just about ready for takeoff. Again, he got up. Again, I pushed him down. And we did this dance several times before I actually lost my temper. It was a tiring job. We worked long hours. And I looked down at this man. There I was, sitting in my seat, looking down right on top of this patient. And I said to him in a very firm and stern voice, I said, if you touch those seatbelts once more and try and get up, I'm going to unbuckle you. I'm going to open up the back of the door of the aircraft. And I'm going to throw you out in the runway. And we're going to leave without you. Do what you're told. I placed my headset on in order to be able to communicate to the pilots over the loud roar of the twin en turbine engines ready for takeoff. And the captain of the aircraft actually said to me, he asked me a question. He said, are you aware of this guy's background? And I said, only that he's been beaten up by two men with baseball bats and left in the cold to die. And he said, there's a little bit more you should know about this man. Those two men were actually the brothers of a woman that this man murdered. In that moment, I reflected on the fact that I just yelled and pushed around a convicted murderer. But then I went on to realise something. His agitation was part of the way I'd been treating him. You see, in big hospitals, we tend to treat people sometimes in a very impersonal way. We get focused on the task, and we actually believe we are something different from our patients. We have this power imbalance. And what I'd realised within myself is I'd lost really what my position of authority was about. I was an authority on emergency services, not an authoritarian over a patient. I wasn't treating this man as an equal. It didn't matter what his background was. And the reason... I felt this power shift was because of the fact that all of a sudden I was no longer the authoritarian in this situation, but rather I felt now he was. He had upper hand on me, given that what he was capable of or what I assumed he was capable of. So in that moment, I completely shifted with the way in which I treated him and every other patient I ever worked with. I started to work with him instead of just simply doing things to him which we're often guilty of working in a healthcare environment. And that's what our patients want. Patients want us to come on a journey with them and to work with them. So the remainder of that two-hour flight went perfectly fine and we actually had a wonderful conversation. And my interactions with patients changed in a lot of circumstances thereafter. But the question for me came, now I understood why it is that it was a challenge for us to listen to our patients' stories when things go wrong. We actually have this defensiveness. I've actually been trained over the years to actually, def to actually document in a way that defends me from the patient should something go wrong. So there's actually something in our culture that actually separates us from the caregiver and the patient. And we don't necessarily do it intentionally to cause harm, but ultimately when things go wrong, it does cause harm in the experience and the eyes of our patients and families. So the question became, how was I going to change this in the healthcare system? I actually found the solution while working in a maximum security prison as a nurse in a clinic. It was here that I stumbled across this concept called restorative practice. And what it was, was people coming together, victims of crimes, coming together to have a conversation with the perpetrator, with the offender who'd been found guilty of this crime. Even in cases of murder, extreme cases of crime, the victim sat there in a room with the offender to have a conversation. To have a conversation about how this crime had impacted on their life. Not just in that one moment, but the ripple effect that took place in people's lives thereafter. And just by sharing that story, the victim felt a sense of relief. 
but it even got more powerful because what happened was the offender would listen to this story and be not only moved by the actual story but actually surprised by the impact that it had far beyond just the crime in that one moment. And the offenders would actually go on to provide an authentic apology. An authentic apology that connected with that patient's lived experience. Sorry, that victim's experience. And the perpetrator was even given an opportunity to share their story, what was going on in their life at that time of the crime. And some victims actually found empathy for the perpetrator. In some cases, victims and perpetrators have actually come together to go on to actually work together to create social change as a result of this powerful model. This model is also used in schools and workplaces where harm has been done through things such as workplace bullying and bullying in schools, where people come together to have this conversation. So what my time taught me while working in the Arctic Circle, in the most unlikely place where I'd learned some of the most profound lessons in my life amongst the Inuit people, and what I learned in this prison system, was that when things do go wrong in healthcare, patients and their families aren't really interested in suing. They're interested in having a conversation. And it doesn't matter how severe the case is, patients and people in general, from my experience, have this amazing capacity to forgive. But what it needs is a conversation with the people that are involved. It's a conversation of actually being able to say, this is what happened to me. And to have the right people to listen to that story. And for people like myself as healthcare providers to acknowledge our part. And we're relevant to say sorry. And that's where the forgiveness happens and that's where the healing takes place. We need to change our hierarchical and defensive culture and nature of healthcare. It's not good for us as healthcare providers and it's not good for our patients and the families and the people that come through our healthcare system. It's about time we genuinely started working together as a collaborative team. We actually don't need lawyers and we actually don't need complaints departments. We need to be able to have an open dialogue. And if that happens, Patients and their families, even when things go wrong in healthcare, can actually go on to tell a different story. And it's one of positivity. So I just want to leave you with just two thoughts. If a story needs to be told, let it be told. And if a sorry needs to be said, have the courage to say it. Thank you.